propose. Uh, last week, we talked about there were three pro properties that, uh, that there were waivers of protest signed. Uh, mm -hmm. People had signed this, this document uh, saying they would not oppose the future annexation. Typically, those are signed in order to get uh, utilities from the city, so sewer or water. Uh, I contacted each of those three people this last week. Uh, none of the three current owners were aware of that waiver protest, but, but none of the three opposed the annexation. Okay. Okay. So out, of nine, out of nine properties in this area, eight were able to be contacted, five were okay with the annexation, three did not want the annexation. That's the bottom line. So uh, on your agenda today is, is um, if I can take you back to the <coughs> board's agenda, there's an item in where you um, may consider um, not to oppose this proposed annexation because uh, that's, that's the proposal. So if, um, items 3C. Yeah, so if, um, oh. there is a timeline associated with this particular matter. And again, the, the, whether you oppose or not, if you oppose this annexation, um, the, the board is not in the position to approve the annexation or not. What you do is you send. But is Tom Water? Uh, no, it's, it's sent to the Boundary Review Board mm -hmm. to have a public hearing. That is the, that is the step That's in the, the process, process. That, you, that you need to take. And what initiated this? Uh, the what was Tom, the motive of yeah. I believe the city of Tom Water systematically, this is not the first time they mm -hmm. start addressing the islands. The islands, yes. So Tom Water has been uh, uh, very strategic in addressing all the islands within the oh. incorporated boundaries. Um, unlike the other cities, they that haven't addressed yeah. the, the islands. So Tom Water has been, from my perspective, proactive in, in addressing the islands within their municipal boundaries. Sure. Question. We don't make that decision anyway. We just make a recommendation, and it may or may not go to the Boundary Review Board. Oh, it'll go to the board. It's going to go to the Boundary Review Board anyway. Mm -hmm. No, it's going to go to the Boundary Review Board if you oppose, you, because you will ask for a review by them. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you do not oppose, then they, 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 board. they just move forward. Even though there are three citizens that oppose. Yeah. And that is not unusual in any particular annexation because no, in an annexation, no everyone is in tune whether they want to be part of a city or not. So the, the split between five and three, that's not unusual. Are there residences on any of these properties right now? Oh, yeah. on, all, on all nine, mm -hmm. or single family residences? Currently, what services does the county provide to those individuals? Good question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Literally, which ones? I mean, the, water, uh, sewer, blah, 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 all of them. Uh, we don't Sheriff. provide water. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't provide water. No. We don't provide sewer. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff's office response, mm -hmm. which uh, from the sheriff's office response, is, you know, don't want to put words in their mouths, but it becomes difficult to respond to an island within the city. Okay. And that becomes uh, onerous. So does there waste uh, management? Uh, that is part know? of the county, so we pick up there. Okay. Yeah. As part of any incorporated. So the street, street maintenance as well. Yeah, and, and obviously the road street. maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Of the three people that oppose it, aside from you reaching out to them, Robert, have they had a, a public say where they can get in front of the mic and and give their their, their point of view? Well, as part of the, uh, the process, Tumwater initiated this annexation. Uh, uh, can't exact said to uh, remove an accounting island. And so they were noticed, uh, uh, given notice, opportunity to comment. Uh, there was a public hearing in front of the, uh, the Tumwater Council. Okay. Uh, so they were given opportunity, uh, but according to the minutes of the council, only one, only one person spoke and testified at the hearing. One of the three. Yes. Those aren't good odds. <laughs> okay. So what is the pleasure of the board? I don't, myself, I don't, I don't see any point in opposing it myself. I, I don't either. And I would rather ride a horse than a fence. <laughs> and it seems to me that it's, if we oppose it, it's going to go to the Boundary Review Board, and these folks will have another opportunity to 
espouse their uh, their opinion, but we also want to do away with the annexation or the the islands, islands rather. Right. We're getting rid of those dadgum islands. Um, and these people have had an opportunity to be heard, so I don't I don't see uh, opposing it. Uh, roads and and law enforcement are two of the big issues I think that hit us, and it'll just make it simpler for everybody and mm -hmm. and more cost effective for the county. I agree. And democratically, <coughs> the majority don't oppose it. That are impacted by it, right? That's correct. Yeah. Did those folks know that we were going to have a discussion on it today after you had contact with all of them except one? Did they know we were debating the issue on what to do? I told them that I would gather the information to, to advise you to provide the information. I didn't tell them that we were meeting today. Do you want to hear from them? No, I, I think like uh, Commissioner Hutchins said, they've had their say, I guess, uh, in the past. No, I think I'm willing to let it go. We're we're trying to get rid of islands, and so this is the part of the process. Yeah, this is uh, the greater good theory. You have to just kind of go with that. As much as I absolutely cherish and work hard uh, individual property rights, this is mm -hmm. probably the better way to go to take care of the larger pieces of life. Let's just put it that way. And I commend Tom Water for mm -hmm. uh, broaching the subject. Yep. Okay. And, uh, Three to zero. One, one last thought sure. on that. And um, and uh, although then the scheme of things, the, this may appear a small item, mm -hmm. but I appreciate the board taking diligence. My problem is, is it going to set a precedent? Uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily. I think uh, the, 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 that we haven't seen yet. We the, don't. The way you have the, the way you have gone through in mm -hmm. in in making sure that you the citizens affected by this particular action have been heard given the opportunity to provide their perspective so from that point of view really i i, I appreciate the, the the board's not just okay. having an item so and approving now the question is how many more islands are we got to go through well that i cannot have that answer at this point is there three there, more islands out there uh, well, there's, there's more, more there's just a lot more saying, yeah. <laughs> there's <laughs> very very What's tiny the islands so some may not be as, as olympia's okay. got several yeah, yeah. So there are many. Well, I'm, not, I'm talking about Tumwater. How many more oh. Tumwater Islands? I, I, I don't have that number, Commissioner. I can yeah. probably reach out, but there are many. Okay. Is this the third or fourth time this has come before the uh, board? I, I recall probably maybe the fourth time the fourth within time. this current commission. So we have, thank you for the comment, not the, the, uh, the acknowledgement, though, that we have given us due diligence. Mm -hmm. No opposition. It's staff have done a great job looking it up and working on it. Thank you. So we'll keep the item on your agenda as is this afternoon. Yeah, as is. Okay, thank you. D does it need to be on the agenda at this point, or does yeah. it go to consent? It, it, it is consent, consent already. It oh, is okay, consent. but I mean, it, we're it, yeah. we're done with the discussion portion yeah. of it at this yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. There's a bow on it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, uh, so it is 9:57. So uh, come back at 10 after 10 for uh, take a 13-minute break. Thank you. A 13-minute break. Mute. In 32 seconds. Mute, Gary. <laughs>
So we're back and I'm still on the pre-agenda agenda. And um, I have, I'm at the commissioner's check-in item. We just covered the number one, time order annexation, uh, SAP Road, and that was a follow-up. Uh, however, I have a, an additional item I'm going to include in there is the chair. And we have a uh, report or a brief back from uh, Teresa Reed, who is uh, director and manager of the fair. And we just want to hear how the fair uh, and fair numbers and activities happened this last uh, couple weeks. So come on up and tell us a little bit about the fair board, fair and fair items. So. Some exciting news to share about the fair this year. On this item right here? Yes. You bet. Yes. So um, just start us off, give us a little bit of background on how many from last year to this year and transitions, and then we'll go into the meat of the things, yeah? So I just wanted to introduce Teresa Reed real quick. Teresa sure. Reed is our uh, community planning and economic development in the fair division. Uh, Teresa is our fair coordinator. She did a great job this last year in the 2018 fair and has been a real asset over the past couple of years in conjunction with the fair board, our volunteer members, and the fair foundation. So Teresa Reed uh, has put together some numbers and also uh, over the past couple of years, we've worked hard at trying to find efficiencies and new ways to improve attendance and participation at the fair. And Teresa's been at the tip of the spear doing those actions. So here's a quick update from Teresa Reed. All right, thank you. Um, it was an exciting year, literally. Uh, that was our theme, exciting, um, with Henrietta Hen. This year, we had a great fair, mostly benefited by the great weather. Um, oh, yes, it was. The yeah. biggest difference between last year and this year was last year they had extreme heat and air quality advisories. So telling people not to go outside and then saying, hey, but come to the fair was a little bit of a mixed message. So we had a great time this year. The weather cooperated. We had um, more attendees, over 25,000 this oh, wow. year. Um, a lot of that is due to the weather and also because we had an update in our technology. We were able to use scanners and iPads as registers at the gates, which gave us a much clearer picture of who was attending and when. Um, we had more exhibits, we had more animal entries, we had more home arts and photography entries. And we had a lot more participation from youth. Two of our biggest um, A lot more participation in youth? In, with youth. Youth, OK, sure. Yeah. The floral department had a youth show for the first time that was oh, right. separate from the adult show. And the home arts department also included a youth show. So that's important in bringing the youth into the, the fair. Um, we had some great increases on military day. And we brought in approximately 189,500. That's about, end up being about 20,000 more than last year initially from my numbers. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, I got questions. So just to uh, book in that, Teresa, I appreciate that she puts a lot of emphasis on the weather. Uh, but without uh, the advertising and the outreach and all the hard work that goes into this, the weather doesn't matter necessarily. The fair board and all the work that Teresa's done and getting the word out has been phenomenal. We advertise all the way up to Whatcom County, all the way out to the Pacific Ocean, and all the way down to Clark County. So we're trying to cover as much of Western Washington as possible in outreach and bringing people from outside of Thurston County into our region to experience our great agricultural products and our kids and all the stuff that they're participating in. So it's a huge deal what these folks put on over 25,000 attendees, as Teresa said, and partnering with the treasurer's office to update our technology and using uh, online sales for the first time ever since 1872. <laughs> since 1872. Okay, you want to put a line in the sand. Oh, do you have any comments or questions? I do. I, I, I guess I'd just comment that the market sale for the kids. Uh, oh, that's what I was going to ask. That's a lot of... Uh, resources that go towards furthering their education in most cases. Mm -hmm. so but those numbers are not on here. No. Well, they had uh, how much they raised. The market sales. The market sales. Oh, I see. Yeah, 115. Yeah. $115,000. I see. Yeah, Number two. I didn't and, see that. Uh, okay. done through a lot of volunteer activity. And, mm -hmm. and that uh, kind of goes back into, you know, kids are 30% of our population with 100% of our future. So mm -hmm. Whatever we yep. can invest. So we just, only so much of a deduction on the IRS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you got to <laughs> okay. plus it up with 115,000, huh? <laughs> yeah, but that that was way cool seeing those uh, the uh, the FFA and the 4-Hers out there was 
just really heartwarming to see how many there were. And they just, they're just so involved in what they do. And it's fun to support them, like you say, through, and it goes to their schooling as well. Now, another increase, on me. Go ahead. Another increase that's not reported is I doubled my intake of corn dogs <laughs> this, over last year. That's um, four in a week. <laughs> I really think that's due to the fact that you spent a lot of time going back to check out the tortoise exhibit. Yeah, five times. <laughs> and then back. So that took a lot of I didn't energy have any there. You needed turtle that. soup. <laughs> but I worked at the Lions Club booth, and so I was patronizing them for, for myself and for family as well. That was fun. And you can talk about the pancake feed at all? Um, yes, 315 uh, orders of pancakes served to thankful, hungry people that morning. It was great. It was a 315 people or pancakes? People. 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 So at, at least 600. Yeah. 600 pancakes. And the Ole wrestling team was out there. And I know they came back mm -hmm. three times through the line, perhaps. And they needed it. And it was the wrestlers. <laughs> yes. And they work hard for us. Yeah, they do. They work. It's a good fundraiser for them as well. So that was a lot of fun, the pancake feed. And that pancake feed was no uh, cost to the taxpayers. Zero cost to the taxpayers. <laughs> that is correct. You pay for that. <laughs> the commissioners and the county manager. The commissioners oh, yeah. and county yeah. managers, yeah. a yeah. gift yeah. to the community. I just love that. It's so mm -hmm. fun. And we had an official pancake counter, or people counter. People counter. People yeah. counter. She did a awesome job. That young job. lady was? Ellen. That young lady was my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Commissioner. No, 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 no. Fair was fun. Uh, uh, approximate income is 189.5. Uh, is there still a count when, when you have a final number? Um, we probably won't have a final number until the end of this month. Um, some of the vendors go back when they're bigger businesses or like the scones, et cetera. They take a little longer to uh, return their uh, checks. But we'll get those in by the end of the month. And then by the beginning of October, all the bills should be in and paid. So I'll have a final bottom line number for you then. No, I'm not done with my question. So, uh, there was an event we had at one time where there was a wine and tasting piece. There is that something to revisit? Did we need it? I mean, no, that was kind of us. Yeah, Saver South Sound, Saver South, no, and uh, we have uh, the local producers of beer, wine, cider, uh, the goods from the Nisqually tribe. Uh, yeah, that's on the agenda to be placed back into a future fair. Uh, there was some planning issues and some coordination that we needed to work out, but I think that we're going to try and do it in the future. Olympia and beyond to make that happen? Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Very well. <laughs> Experience Olympia okay. and beyond, yep. Now this this is all excellent news and it's upbeat and fun. But was there any glitches, uh, whether it be electricity or backed up toilets or anything major that happened that was kind of like, ah, we got to work around that for next year? So there's kind of two questions there. Were there any yeah. glitches and was there anything major? Okay. There was nothing major, but there was a lot of glitches. As any event where you've got 25,000 people coming through <laughs> your gates, you're going to have, like you said, backed up toilets and <laughs> power outages from boxes and broken fuses and blown fuses. And that kind of stuff. But that's, and that's what Teresa does. Is she's coordinating that. I'm, gonna, I'm keeping the mic because she can't talk great about herself, so I'm going to say it. Every one of those glitches doesn't become major because Teresa and her team is able to address it quickly. And so having that type of management on site during the event keeps anything from getting too out of control. But yeah, there's always glitches, but it's fun and keeps Teresa occupied. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah. I guess we're always working on a limited budget and uh, I, I don't know if you do utilize the state surplus and uh, logistics, Fort Lewis uh, logistics center maybe for being able to get things to help do your job? Do you do that? Yes, um, we've received things from surplus and any time that there's something that could be useful to us, we have some people that let us know. We have gotten some great fencing um, and other items that we use out of the fairgrounds. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you very much for all your effort and dedication that you put in personally. To, to that question, though, we're always open for new partnerships. So anybody that wants to partner with the fair, check in with Teresa. Teresa Reed at uh, her email there. Okay. Yeah, Teresa, thank hey, you so thank much. You. And I will highlight the numbers in my report this afternoon. 
for the rest of the public. Thank, thank you. you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Come on back now. So the next item I have is the TRP RCO. So that's the Thurston Regional Planning Commission and Council and the Recreational Conservation Office, office yeah, so um, RCO, physical letter agent. Yeah, this is a uh, follow-up to the conversation you, um, you had last week. And this letter is to um, proposal is to send um, uh, to the state, Ms. Kellen Cunningham. She's the director of the Recreation and Conservation Office. Uh, a little bit of a background. <coughs> this is related to the um, uh, RCO, uh, the recovery, uh, salmon recovery, I, I believe it is, um, Resource Conservation Office, which is, deals with the uh, salmon recovery projects, uh, particularly in this case is related to WIRA 13. Um, uh, in the past, the Thurston Conservation District has been the fiscal agent for that particular grant, which is probably about $800,000, $830,000 a year. And uh, that's intended to fund projects um, within the WIRA 13. So the Thurston Conservation District was only a pass through to be the fiscal agent because the WIRA 13 doesn't have that fiscal uh, responsibility or ability. Um, uh, the Thurston Conservation District missed the deadline um, of July 13 as to how they can uh, 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 agree to continue to be the fiscal agent for this particular grant. So you made a, uh, we had a discussion, you had a discussion and we agreed that perhaps the best possible third party that doesn't have much of a uh, 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 stake on, on the particular funds will be the Thurston Regional Planning Council, which is TRPC. I submitted a letter for your consideration last week, um, and you had a discussion that will let you would like to add an additional paragraph. And um, I have added that paragraph. It's paragraph number three. And if I may, I'll read that to you. And it states, in addition, Thurston County has, has taken a proactive approach to address salmon habitat recovery by investing $4 million in 2017-2018 to remove culvert salmon barriers, and we will continue to support this effort in the future. We are committed to enhancing fish habitat and look forward to the opportunity to partner with you to implement a more impactful salmon habitat recovery program in Thurston County. Um, I believe I capture the discussion in this paragraph, but uh, you have any additions, revisions? Both of them. Go ahead. No, I, I do thank you covered what our concerns were. Uh, I did have an opportunity to uh, uh, talk with uh, Kayleen last week and explained what we were doing and she said that they have, they also uh, oversee other additional funding sources that we might be able to leverage from them with what we're doing. So I'm looking forward to maybe working uh, with her, or at least our staff working with them, to see if we can't uh, do a little more with what we're doing right now. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm good with it. Thank you very much. And thank you for that standalone paragraph in, uh, in the letter to uh, the RCO that says that we've, uh, Thurston County has been proactive to address the salmon habitat recovery by investing $4 million in 1718 and continue to support this effort. And that's that. To me, I mean, that's, that's just vital right there and shows a commitment. And uh, <coughs> so I support TRPC in doing that. All right. Are we going to sign this and move along, or is it, does uh, it become part of our... Uh, we'll wait. Uh, uh, I'll circulate later for your signature. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have any additional edits or, or changes. Okay, so we'll sign it here shortly. Uh, so I'm going to move on to item number three, which is the water resources transition to public works. This is just informational. Yeah, um, but the director of public needed. works and, and the director of CPAD will give you a perspective. And so the can somebody just manager. frame it? Because this has been a four-year conversation, a three-year yes, conversation. Can um, you just give a framework for people on the video or the YouTube so they can understand what's been going on? Because um, I know it. Thank you, Commissioners. The, the, this has been a long time coming. At least probably you and I can probably attest to that. Right. The gist of this particular um, um, action that you may um, want to agree, may want to agree or disagree, is um, 
there's always there's a continuing effort to align the businesses in the county to uh, uh, streamline the process. As a result, we, we're going to be more efficient in using the taxpayer dollars in delivering the services to the county. Um, and this item is related to the water resources. That's a division under the CPED uh, department at this point. And um, so if, if you were to look specifically what the, the gist of, of the work, the water resources does, is public works under the definition of the uh, RCW, the Revised Code of Washington. And with that mantra, uh, some of the work the water resources do, they hire public works to do their work in terms of engineering and carry on the construction management and so on and so forth. So it, it, at least from my point of view, because I do have a vested interest on this <laughs> in as history, um, it does make sense to realign to bring the water resources under the, under the purview of public works. Um, and um, uh, th this, uh, this particular transition has been worked between the two directors, and, uh, and we have uh, uh, Tim. They has served as, as the individual who has managed the transition. So at this point, um, both of them are in the position to give you as to where we are and perhaps the implementation plan as we move ahead if you choose to move forward. You got a question already? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. just, a, just a quick one. Uh, there was some transfer of this activity s several years back that caused some problems. Uh, I don't know, there was some movement of office furniture, of space, uh, the physical move caused some uh, issues with the lake management districts, I'll just put it that way. What we're proposing today, or what we're discussing today, that's not going to kind of reopen that and cause another aggravation for those folks. Yes. Yeah. No impact and no relation to the lake management districts. Okay. Good enough. I have a comment, question? So I have far? a question. Yeah, what would what you anticipate, looking at the phasing, 1 through 2B, how long would you anticipate this would take to get this from here to completion? Could, could I suggest uh, at this point so give the directors the opportunity to explain the the whole process. Oh, yeah, okay then. <laughs> well, and maybe you've had an opportunity to take a look at the report that was prepared, but I'll just back up for just a minute. So um, when Josh and I came in, um, the direction was to move forward with the transition. And so what we focused on was let's take a look at the work, the business services. And so really that, that key in terms of level of service, what work is being done, where are there opportunities for efficiencies. And so we did that by forming a really cross-department team. So we had managers from both water resources and public works. Tim led that effort, um, and they looked at the individual um, divisions and work that's being done. And so what you'll find in the report, and, and specifically the, the reorg um, diagram that we have here as our proposal, is um, some moving around of different groups. So we took a look at um, water, water resources, um, specifically, um, there are three divisions. We also took a look at what was happening within public works. Um, so we had, um, as you know, water and sewer utilities and said, well, are there some opportunities there? So specifically looking at um, Kevin Patchings and his group. So Teresa has um, been really responsible for managing two large programs. And so this is moving that piece of that program into uh, the um, water resources group. Um, and I don't know, I'm gonna, these are larger. So how about a, can you see that? I can okay. see that, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so we really focused on um, where could we gain those um, efficiencies. So we looked at um, some challenges that existed in terms of removing department silos. So there was some communication issues between the group, as Romero mentioned. Um, Public Works does do work for solid waste, not only for the main. I did that again. Water resources, Public Works does work for water resources, both in terms of engineering and also um, maintaining their catch basin and sweeping and that type of thing. Um, we looked at uh, communication and accountability process improvements. So um, 
work that's being done now that maybe there's a little bit of misalignment in terms of how um, maybe Water Resources thinks it should be done versus how Public Works is doing it and some opportunities there. Um, reallocation of staffing priorities. Um, so right now we're looking at um, managing the um, NPDES permit and we do that for all of the county, um, not just within the um, unincorporated, uh, UGA unincorporated areas. Um, and then some staff reassignments, as I mentioned, for example, Teresa. For the public's benefit, NPDES? NPDES is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Thank you. So what you have in front of you um, is looking at taking the technical services, which is um, Pat Allen's group, and moving uh, that group along with um, combining water and sewer utility operations into that group. Um, Ryan Langen, Langen's group, which is the operations and maintenance, and then uh, Noxious Weed and Lakes Management, and forming that group as the Water Resources Division. Um, separating out the NPDES coordination and compliance, um, because they're responsible for ensuring that um, the department, or excuse me, that the county is in compliance with our NPDES permit. And so there's some opportunities there in keeping those separate. Um, so we don't have the uh, kind of that separation of power. So the, the regulatory piece of it for compliance versus the operations that's actually being done um, within public works. Did you want to add anything to that? Josh? So CPED supports any opportunity to find efficiencies. And as the county manager relayed at the beginning, this is one of those opportunities. And the high level uh, effect of this recommendation is the employees that currently reside in Water Resources Division of CPED, of those employees, 16 will transfer to Public Works and eight will remain in CPED. And those eight that remain are, as Jennifer just stated, the folks working on the NPDES, the permit and planning kind of stuff where the operations goes to public works, so it's tied to the utility fund. Uh, but we will continue to collaborate as one county, uh, public works and CPED, uh, finding ways to serve our citizens in a more efficient manner. So that's the high level. 16 FTEs go to public works, eight stay in CPED. So this is the, the proposed plan. Um, the actual moving forward approval piece of it is a part of the budget process, but we really wanted to get a sense from you as to are we on the right track, thumbs up, or no, we need to um, course correct. And, and this is the opportunity to give us some guidance on course correcting. And uh, any course correcting? <laughs> well, just I'm, I'm curious when we talk about water, uh, do citizens now have to uh, for septic systems, for an example, and septic permits. That's separate than anything you're talking about here now, right? It's public health. And it, yeah, public health. But are people going to be required to deal with one group and then back and forth with public health I, uh, as far as with the arts group? I'm just trying to figure that all out. Is there, <laughs> is there some way we can make that more effective? effective as well this the process that we have here or the plan that we're proposing here um, doesn't look to change um, any any anything with that but I think as a part of a, another effort that Josh and I are working on and coordinating with Shelley um, we're looking at gaining um, some efficiencies and and more importantly looking at from the customers perspective improving service but mm -hmm. this this specific effort is not addressing that what this is addressing is that proposal to transition water resources division over to public works and combining the utilities, the utility um, groups into one section. Maybe to answer your question, uh, perhaps from a different perspective. Um, right now we have um, uh, three departments, you know, public health that does the septic, water resources, CPED, and public works that does the rest of the utilities. With this particular approach, it will reduce to only two departments. So in a way, it does address your question to bring those efficiencies as opposed to going through a three-prong approach, it will be only two-prong approach. 
How do we get it to a one pound of protein? Uh, that will require a larger conversation. And, and the conversation will be, uh, perhaps, it will take some time to look at the programs themselves and how the permitting process will work. And uh, we are uh, embarking an effort, had a meeting already with the three directors to specifically start talking as to how we create efficiencies related to the permitting process. Because if you, if you were to look from the citizen's perspective, they really cannot understand the division between a public health department, public works department, or CPED department. It's just the county. That's right. The county as a whole. So from, from that perspective, we are having conversations as to how we can streamline the process to provide better services to the citizens. Go ahead. I, I, are you doing any physical moving of personnel? That was eight? my question. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. Me back. We're the 16th city. So this is that check-in to say if we're on the right path. If we're on the right path, then we'll start to explore those physical move next steps. But yeah, probably there will be some space planning considerations. <laughs> and then, again, coming back to the citizens that have to do business, are they then going to have to run out to Tilly and back to here, or, you know, so consolidation of services and such? I don't know how much outreach um, or how frequently the citizens come into stormwater to the water resources group, um, but we can certainly take a look at that. Um, I think it's more them, um, the employees going out into the field versus um, customers coming in, but we'll take a look at it. In phase 2B, uh, it says work with consultants to assess space needs and reconfiguration of the Tilly campus. Correct. The, the consultant would be just specifically for that need and not for the workload and, and find out how many people are doing the coming in for storm water. That's, that's stuff we would do. Correct. That is, um, that is a looking at the existing space that we have at the Tilly campus and assessing where can, how can we fit in the, the 16 um, people coming over from water resources. The consultant work would be through our facilities section of central services. Correct. Right. Okay. But there is a, uh, if I made the, the facility analysis that Jennifer is pointing out, is not just to look at the space related to this transition. It's looking at overall the, the whole campus because the whole campus needs to go through reassessment of uh, parking needs and how circulation is occurring. So all that will be a comprehensive analysis of the site including the internal the space. Okay. For this. So it's, it's more comprehensive than the, 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 uh, this just related to this transition. All right. The workspace planning as well as traffic circulation and parking. Because there's vehicles coming over also if, this is, if we're moving forward. In terms of timing, the planning piece of it would occur um, through the end of the year starting with implementation at the beginning of January. But even on that implementation, that then requires reconfiguration of space. What are the changes that actually have to happen as a part of that traffic circulation so that we are physically able to move um, individuals over to Tilly. But my desire would be to have those folks that are coming into Public Works move over as soon as possible um, after the first of the year. Does HR know? They're aware of it. So if we're able to move forward, that's the next piece is, is starting to do some of the additional work that needs to happen as a part of this planning. All righty, so you have any, any more qualms about that? My main concern is the service to the community and how we best provide that for them. That's kind of where I'm at. So if you always bear that in mind. I'm okay with it. Efficiencies and alignment, mm -hmm. delivering services quicklier to the quicklier. community. Quicklier. <laughs> to the community. So those were the main, so some of the, the specific goals that were identified for the team as a part of this effort were to provide those cost efficiencies, improve level of service, take advantage of program overlap, 
um, and address current and future needs. Um, and so that was one of the main things that we did take into consideration, that the team took into consideration. All right. You know, one other thing, we're, we're talking about enhancing our salmon culvert activities. Mm -hmm. So would these fit in as well as, as we move forward? And storm water, I'm wondering about storm water and water quality. We've had some discussion about that. Is that also? Um, in, in, at this point, if I may, my, my perspective is um, this move and realignment is going to create um, greater synergies in providing those, in, in aligning those programs. Because my personal uh, observation has been there's always have, have been this divisional, departmental uh, state that we have to always work through that process. And I think this realignment really is going to be looking, concentrating on the outcome, on the projects, on the programs, and the services to the citizens. And, uh, and there is going to be a, 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 an added value that we, at this point we don't, cannot put uh, dollars and cents, but certainly it's going to be an add-on value down the road. So if my, if my upfront question was uh, uh, answered in, in, in the discussion, I missed it, but is this something that's going to take six months, a year, year and a half? We'll have a better idea at the end of this year once we have the plan from the consultant as to what actually needs to happen with the Tilly space and traffic re circulation to know how long is it going to take to do that work, but I anticipate that happening next year after, oh, yeah. you know, upon approval. Okay. Thank you. Are we going to have to do some construction if we move people out there? It, it could yeah. include that. Um, first of all, will be whether the existing space is adequate. If not, uh, you know, additional construction. Um, but uh, it, let me take you back even to over a year ago. The Tilly campus used to have a restriction on the on the uh, previous surface, the the roof coverage mm -hmm. as we know it, and uh, you took an action to change that. Um, and now it doesn't have that restriction, which allowed the department, Jennifer, to look holistically what the needs of the sites are. Was that the percentage change? The, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, that and um, yeah. so all that is just coming together uh, uh, for, for, for your consideration. Okay. Are we talking about doing that same thing for the citizens in the county? We, we did it for our needs. Are we, are we talking about... Is that still on our comprehensive it's, it's plan? It's still part of uh, Josh's uh, uh, workload, yes. Okay. All right. We're all in favor. Do you have a quick comment? I just, um, my comment is that um, I support this proposal. I, I recommend approval of it. Uh, there's a lot of really great work put into the work plan. Um, do want you to be aware we've put in a, a request in the budget that you'll review this fall and it does have an impact to general fund um, because of the need to reallocate administrative cost within um, CPED. So when you take stormwater out, we reallocate the cost. That's an increase in those sections Where of are those numbers at? that are paid for the general fund. Um, it is the latest cost estimate that we've looked at is approximately thirty-seven thousand uh, dollars to the general fund each year. So it's not a large hit, but you needed to be aware as you approve that there is an impact. Does that change your mind? No, but I would want to make sure that we always strive to collect from those funds that uh, and have those funds pay that do have resources in them. So yep. I don't know what kind of stretching you have to do, but I would, I would want you to always be looking for that stretch. So I don't know, uh, I've heard kind of consistently it's one third, two thirds in a lot of these areas, so. Those are indirect costs. Indirect this is costs, a little right. different. Um, it's allocation of overhead within the department. Um, we do, to the extent we can under the law, uh, allocate the costs to non-general fund 
uh, sources. However, we have to be able to pass the um, the legal requirements Audit of goodness. fair and equitable. Yeah. Does that change your mind on the impact of the budget? No. Nope. Should. Be. No. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, around for I have to give video. kudos to yes. this guy, Tim, because he is the one who has worked through those issues and providing the report. So thank you, Tim. You're a rock star. Noxious weed. Yep. <laughs> Parrot feather. Parrot feather. <laughs> okay, we have a few minutes to knock out a couple more of these. Uh, next one is the Public Works video in CSA building. Uh, yes, so this is an opportunity that we are taking advantage. Hey, well done. <laughs> the mic turned off. That we are taking advantage of. So back in 2016, we received, um, at part of the Innovative Safety Program, we received some grant money for um, the high friction surface treatment. And out of, as a part of that, the Washington um, State DOT received grant funds to do a public service announcement for um, basically highlighting, identifying, and promoting um, innovative safety countermeasures that have been put in place. And so of the eight agencies that were um, asked to do this for being county, we were the um, only agency that's actually participating. So you will see a, a video here that showcases what we're doing in Thurston County to improve safety. Um, it has a value of about $15,000 in putting it together, but it's actually been no cost to the county, minimal staff time. How long a video? That's it is I'm very short, it, about 30 seconds. How much? 30, 30 seconds. 30 so it will be shown on 32 Facebook, seconds? About 30 seconds, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, Facebook, Instagram. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it'll run for about a rate. month. Goodness. Yeah. And it's got the best. We practiced it. It's just music. It's just music in the background. So you'll see the words on the screen. I like it so far. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> It's funny how the microphone came on when this came on. Okay. Technology. Technology. You gotta hit the right button. Play it again. High friction surfacing is a proactive. Is that what this is about? Is just high friction? Oh, we've, I thought we've had that presentation. No, no, no. but this is, this is a video showcasing a video. what the county has done. It's going to make it available statewide. That is, the, that is the difference. As you may recall, we receive a grant, the county receive a grant as a demonstration Pilot grant. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, I guess, highlighted the great work the department has done. It is in talking about it, communicating it out as a part of that effort as well. Um, I Take see it on, on some corners where there's shade in the winter and yeah. stuff. I've seen where it's applied. And you can feel it. Yeah, you know, it, it, there's you, a little difference. Yeah, you, you know. can really feel the... You don't yeah. want to fall down on your bicycle. You're going to scrape your knees. <laughs> well, Maybe we want to try again. Oh, did I miss it? No, yeah, we missed it. <laughs> I looked down. <laughs> All right, there you go. Are you narrating or is somebody gonna narrate? There's narrating? music in the background and so this is this is what you would get is those ads that pop up when you're on Facebook or Instagram uh, um, or you're watching Apple TV. So it's Apple it's a TV. quick the words just come up, there's music uh, in the background. Okay. Um, and like I said, it'll air for about um, thirty days. Um, and we're also gonna put a um, little blurb about it on our is the Beatles song Long and Windy Road? Is that the, <laughs> is that what plays? <laughs> you know, best laid plans, I, I believe. Best laid plans. Of mice and man. <laughs> and the dollar well spent. As long as the background song is not my way to hell. Yeah. <laughs> But I do think it's in alignment with what you were talking about, about telling our story and communicating. And that is exactly it. Yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin, that was good. Good job. Makes so. me extremely happy. Right. Thank you. No, no. Thank you. If you got any more videos, bring Thank them on back. <laughs>
we like videos. Okay, the next item we have is the CSA building discussion. It's not really a discussion because I put this on there. Yeah, you, you want to have this conversation. Well, and, what uh, portion of the building is sitting empty, and I just want to know what the update is on the... Uh, yeah, the, uh, and I attached to, uh, to your briefing some of the options that you heard a few months ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm not looking for a lot of time. I'm just looking for a quick update. Okay, so... So the quick update... Is it still no. picking up? Okay. So the quick update is it's where we left it at the discussion at the beginning of the year where you were presented a number of options for potential development of the site. Uh, these have been carried forward into the budget and capital facilities planning processes. We still have a placeholder project in the 2019-2024 proposed capital facilities plan along with a, a, a budget change request that uh, matches that gives you the opportunity when you're ready to make a decision on tenancy and uh, utilization uh, to go forward with uh, okay. a project of some kind. But oh, we don't know what the project is? No. We're, okay. The options, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, okay. we've looked at a number of different scenarios. Uh, a number of different programs have come forward with potential uh, use of the facility. Uh, examples include potential... We're talking uh, about the empty portion, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Potential use as a detox facility, mm -hmm. potential use for pretrial services, or at least a, a portion of the facility for pretrial services. We've looked at whether it could support expanded court space. We've looked at whether it could support uh, relocation of either the IT department or uh, central services admin out there, um, and a, a handful of others, including, I think, uh, it's a, a conversion. It's like court facility. Right. Uh, perhaps that's going to be addressed on the flex unit right. project. Okay. And some of them, the needs assessments showed they would either you know, be too large for the footprint. Um, some have issues around limited parking on the site. Uh, so all of that is summarized in, in the briefing materials and, and you know, uh, we're happy to uh, re-engage with you when the time comes to talk about kind of narrowing down what direction would you like to set for that. Okay. Uh, so mm, well, the reason why I brought that up is because the Behavior Health Organization is looking for a place to do six more beds. Yep. I didn't know where we were at in the whole process. The six more beds could help us, I'm speaking of a BHO mm -hmm. hat here, help in terms of the way things are um, maneuvering for 2020. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm not advocating one way or the other, I just didn't know where we were at. Because those others you listed there are, are equally important. Mm -hmm. And so we need to sit down and really do some, uh, some discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you put that on the calendar 30 days out, 40 days out? Uh, you you yeah. want to have this conversation as a Board of County Commissioners or as a, a uh, Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization? Well, as a, as a Board of County Commissioner, yeah. yeah. And we will be coming to you in September for the overall capital facilities plan oh, okay. and budget briefing, and this okay. would be one of the projects we'll you'd see. put 30 minutes that. extra on there because we need to go through some and okay. at least dwindle down to two at least, something like that, three, maybe two yeah, the choices. items. So. Okay. So we can focus this a bit more. And I don't know what they are, but I just I just know they're all important. This is very premature, and you perhaps uh, you and Romero might be a part of this conversation, Rob. And that is, as we move, as we try to move more people out of work release and onto EHM, converting or using a piece of the work release building, reducing that from 60, 66 beds down to what's what remember might be manageable reconfiguring it and moving pre-trial services out there as well. That very preliminary. Have you mm. heard of that? I've not heard about any proposals to nope. or, or I, scenarios affecting the corrections options facility. Just banter, yeah. But I, have, I am familiar with, and we did look at uh, the space needs that pretrial services would have. The, uh, they actually would not require all of the available space that's left in the CSA building. They'd need about two-thirds of it. Um, so that is one of the scenarios that was reviewed uh, for you at the beginning of the year. Hmm. Um, they are looking at about, we have about 2,800 square feet available, and they would be looking at about 1,500 square feet for pretrial services. 
uh, six in, bed in CSA. yeah a six bed either a detox center or a six bed expansion of the triage facility would require all of that space but it it would fit in within the available footprint sure. is our understanding Real quick so I I understand that um, there is a potential if the CSA space were used uh, to benefit the BHO Good, I don't potential. Know. Sure. Um, on the other hand, it would be very helpful for the county to understand what the potential future of the BHO is because we have an agreement. We still own the entire building. Yeah, no. And if for any reason that building would no longer be used as a triage center, that may change what the Board of County Commissioners would want to do with the property. Oh, yeah. So that, that I think a, we've got... That's an upfront requirement. Right. Um, but it would be very helpful, I know for me in particular, but I think for others as mm -hmm. well in, on county staff, to understand what it is that the the BHO is facing over the next okay. couple of years. I'll get Mark and Joe in here to tell. That would sure. help. Thank you very much. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Martin. All right. Well, okay. I got to get through two more real quick in the next three minutes, I guess, if we're staying on time. Mm -hmm. So the Puget Sound uh, Green Direct Phase, is that just a quick discussion um may take a, a a few more minutes maybe uh, i would like to probably have the conversation of the office assistance support and if it's time between the five-year homeless plan and the executive session suggesting that they will touch base on the uh on the uh green direct okay let's skip this okay so the office support you want to talk about that yep. mm -hmm, real yes, quick and then I do have one on the advisory board and commission. I wanted to see if we can get that done. Too. So it was a lot. Okay, what do you got here? So um, last week I made a proposal to Romero, and we would like to recommend to you the extension of the temporary appointment of the office assistant position um, to June 30 of 2019. Um, so we currently have a temporary help that is backfilling for Whitney, who is out on maternity oh, leave. Oh, this is what this is, okay. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'd like to request that we extend that to June 30 of 2019, and then at that time in May of next year, reassess whether we have the workload and the financial capacity to extend it further. Okay. Um, the need of the office is that um, we're in the process of launching quite a few countywide initiatives All right. that the office has a critical role in. Um, that includes the ERP system. ERP. ERP, that's the um, Enterprise Reporting uh, Planning, Enterprise Reporting Planning System. That's our finance and See, payroll and budget. I just, I know what an ERP system is. I just can't say what the acronym is. Um, but that's where we're replacing uh, our payroll and our munis, and it has some other modules. That in itself is going to be a huge two-year effort of the county. And um, according to Scott Floresk and Katie Gerard, we could be spending, the, the representative in each office could be spending up to 70% 75% of their time in some weeks on that project and we don't have capacity and then we have a few other um, efforts going on uh, that also need some time and attention from our office we just don't have the capacity um, so I asked Romero if he would yes. consider and now we're asking you mm -hmm. um, so the, there's a, the way to pay for it. I've, I've uh, looked at a potential way to pay. Uh, the, the, um, this year, for the rest of this year, I believe we could absorb the cost in the commissioner's budget. Um, for next year, when you look at the budget next year, we're reducing costs in non-departmental by $1.3 million. Um, this paper lists the major areas where that reduction is happening. We think if we take, I think, if we take 40,000 of that reduction, we'd still be reverting 1.3 million 
Um, but we take 40,000 and use that for this position through June 30th next year. So I think that there's uh, room in the budget for it. The reason I'm asking right now is the current appointment ends at the end of this month. Um, Whitney is planning to come back in a week and a half and the transition will begin. Yep. We'll capture it, huh? Yeah. So, so that's why I'm thought. asking now mm -hmm. and not waiting for the budget. Mm -hmm. You obviously have a thought, go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, and are we current expense? It, it is <laughs> two thirds, one third. So it is general fund with about half of it coming back on the two year leg. Why does it have to be half? How come one third can't be? Well, uh, it's, it's that it's whatever that other. break is. It's, well, isn't that kind of roughly what the break it is, is? Roughly the break. Yeah. So it's, out of that twenty, uh, what you're down around eight or yeah. Out of current expense? Yes. Yeah. And remember, it's a two-year lag. It's a two-year lag. Two year lag. So yeah, well. it, it, the indirect cost will be recovering that year. Yeah, yeah. two years. But still, in, yeah. in the end, that's right. about Yes. It. So in fact, all, get through it? It, it, yeah. except for your salaries <laughs> in the commissioner, <laughs> it, except for your salaries in the commissioner's office, all of our salaries are on that, and that is split, indirect cost. Okay. And so Whitney's due to come back? <sighs> Uh, I, it is the, I believe it's the 27th, um, 20, 22nd, but Bob she's going to come on a, on a part-time basis okay. in the morning, so that will be a great transition to start okay. working on that. So that person that is the staffing that would continue in that role and then go where? Look for other so we'd have projects. to find a place for that person to sit, but um, I, I, they but would not just... Here. Be they wouldn't be doing work here, they'd be doing work? In the commissioner's office. In the commissioner's office. office. Yeah, they'd yeah, okay. stay in the commissioner's it's office. Still in the commissioner's office. They, yeah. they would be our representative. They would um, be the project coordinator for the policy update. They would be the backup and um, project support for the ERP project. They would assist with the rollout of performance measures and keeping that up to date. Um, and they would be available to assist okay. in the front office as necessary. So all these major fronts and projects that we're launching are all from here, not HR or anywhere else, that's, just here. That's where we partner with everyone else, but right. we've got need okay. right here in our office. All right, thank you. But the deadline is June 30th. That would be, it would be a, a temporary position with an end date. You'd see an AIS for that on your September 11th agenda. Yeah, um, but I just want to fourth. Why not 30 June? It should there, be fourth. It says 11th. That's why I have it oh. underlined. Oh, well, we could put it on the fourth, on the fourth if we rush it on. Mm -hmm. but. For, but not um, June, past June 30th is my thing. No, so. the end date would be June 30th. We could okay. reassess later if it would be longer. Okay. But okay. If that's good with you, then I'll get that on the AIS. Good. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Well, I'm going to jump to a five-year plan, but before we do, I have to go to number nine and clean up one thing from last time. Mm. Clean up being a good word here. Uh, uh, can, there was can, a can you call up Anita? motion to, we were on hold to oh, appoint yeah. um, Shannon Vernon to the fair board. And I don't know if the fair manager or coordinator, what, somebody needed that at a week's time. And I just want to make sure we got that week's time in because uh, we're going to move forward. Uh, and let me touch base with La Bonita. She's coming, but I have not received any feedback related to the week's time that it was requested. And I, I think Commissioner yeah, Edwards, I think you were looking. I think, I think everything. everything. Josh, do you want to come? Quick. I just want to okay. get okay. this out of the way and then. So we'll another process happened or something? Just discussion mm -hmm. at right, the fair okay. process. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Fair manager. So the fair coordinator, Teresa Reed, who you guys saw earlier, had an opportunity to speak with members of the fair board about this uh, appointment of uh, Shannon Vernon to the fair board. And uh, the path forward from the fair coordinator is to proceed at will. Okay. It's the commissioner's choice to appoint. So do you have uh, any objections for Shannon Vernon? No. No. How about you? Nope. Nope. We're good. So with your concurrence, then we'll bring this item this afternoon. Today. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good okay, job. we're going to move into the five-year plan, and I'm going to bring Shelley to the board, um, to the table, okay. and Derek and or Keith. No. Who else wants to come to the table? Um, and talk about the five-year plan for about. Gary, part of that. Let's see if Shelley wants her to. So. No. Who else do you want to pair with you, Shelley and Derek? Um, Gary. 
Gary, cool, sure. And just before we get started, do a round of introductions for yourself so, and your role that you're playing here. And then we'll go. Do you have any handouts, Shelly? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I play the role of commission. Well, he, he has multiple roles. He has multiple roles. He has multiple roles. I, I want to make sure. Funny. And so, and so, thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Sure. Uh -huh. Go ahead. So, uh, I'm Gary Barris. Unfortunately, we have to move the mic as we talk. Yeah. So unfortunately, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I typically let people pull the mic away from me. So, <laughs> you know, loud voice. Um, so, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Community Youth Services. Uh, I'm the chair of the Homeless Housing Hub, which has three main functions. One, it is the, the lead of the red team for the housing action teams, which is Thirst and Thrive. Um, it represents the local continuum of care, which uh, represents all the activities associated with HUD and state CHD dollars, um, as well as it's connected to the Thurston uh, Asset Building Coalition and all of the things that they're trying to accomplish through all the other hubs in the community. Great. And Shelley Slider, Director of Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. Mm -hmm. Gary Eaton, uh, Public Health Staff. Keith Staley, City of Olympia Community Planning and Development Director, and our staff participated directly in developing this plan. We're glad to be here. Sure. And the other team from Atlanta? Who are you? I'm Ivy Butler from the City of Olympia. Amy and Colin? Sure. So, Shelly, if I can just use you, kind of give a backdrop. Uh, we've already met for this one time month before the Board of County Commissioners and just discussed something. So that's kind of a part B or part two, if you will, and what we're going to uh, delve into here and why we have Olympia and Derek here as far as moving forward to possibly adopting this as a, as a five-year plan. Yes, sir. Um, this um, item is on your agenda for this afternoon at 2 o'clock to consider approving the five-year plan. Uh, homeless housing plan uh, as required uh, by state statute. Uh, about a month ago, we came and did a briefing to you and just to recap what we covered, we covered the high level goals, uh, we discussed process and who participated on the development of this plan. And as Derek stated, he is chair of the continuum of care and uh, the continuum of care is the body that recommends this to you. So um, he is chair of that advisory committee that's bringing this forward to you today. So that is why uh, I asked Derek to be here and he'll be here this afternoon as well. Uh, Keith also, um, happy to have City of Olympia here today as a partner in this. Uh, the group that worked to develop this plan uh, included a representative from the largest city, which was the city of Olympia, and a select um, provided quite a lot of uh, work on this plan. We're very grateful for her participation. Um, other participants uh, include uh, a formerly uh, homeless person, and Phil Owen represented that role. Um, he is also the executive director of Sidewalk. Uh, Derek. Uh, Harris represented uh, youth through community youth services. Uh, we also had the Housing Authority of Thurston County um, as a housing um, developer that participated. Uh, Commissioner Blake, you yourself uh, represented Thurston County on that committee. Thank you very much for that. Um, at In a previous role that I, um, I held, I was chair of the committee that um, Derek now chairs and I participated in, in the development of that as well. So that met our requirements for who would be on, um, who would be a minimum on the committee, and there was a much broader group of stakeholders that participated in it, so um, I'll want to uh, offer my thanks to them this afternoon as well uh, for all of their hard work on this. Um, this process has been ongoing um, for about two years two years, um, just to give a little brief background uh, again, we previously had a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Uh, unfortunately, we did not end homelessness during that time period, um, but uh, we did um, make some good progress and provided funding for um, uh, many amazing organizations and projects that helped us to move the needle, but the demand and the need uh, for services for those experiencing homelessness, shelter, and housing um, has, uh, has not kept up. So we are now in a crisis. Um, as you know, 
since you also sit on the Board of Health. The Board of Health declared a homeless crisis last month on June 14th and um, included in that resolution uh, there was reference to the Board of County Commissioners adopting this plan, which we're going to go over today and answer any further questions. So we discussed the high-level goals last time, the groups that participated. Um, we made a couple revisions um, and did some minor um, cleanup on the document. We brought this back out to the um, housing action team of Thurston Thrives and went over, um, went over some key elements again. And so I think... Um, for today, what we'll do is um, go over the work plan. I'm going to pass it over to Derek since um, he's the advisory body that's recommending to go over a few other points, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Right, thank you, Shelley. Um, so I, I really kind of just want to um, go over some of the, again, some of the higher level, but, you know, kind of uh, from the local continuum of care, some other reasons why we want to make sure that we move forward with adopting the plan um, today. Um, so really in the creation of this plan, um, we had state government agencies, local government, nonprofit, faith-based advocates, public housing agencies, business community, philanthropic, um, all work collectively and with urgency um, to support the high-performing systems and programs with the best outcome for people experiencing homelessness. Um, this is a solvable issue in our community, and we must continue to learn from an adopted five-year plan that the research and evidence that we collect from utilizing this plan is something that will be the map for us in this community um, to really talk about our successes and challenges. Um, I want to go through a few reasons why we should adopt the plan. One, we're required to have an adopted plan. <laughs> State homeless who, housing who by, it, by who? By who? Yeah. Uh, we're required by um, CHG uh, Commerce, State Commerce, and through the local continuum of care um, through HUD. Right. So these are two uh, large funding bodies that actually bring uh, resources into our communities. Without an adoptive plan, um, all of us who are applying for grants and applications to again to bring dollars into this community that is not generated by this community. Um, we were not meeting compliance, and our applications will not look as good. Oh, wow. Okay, good. Um, so the State Homeless Housing and Assistance Act, as well as the state's Homeless Housing Strategic Plan of 2017, also requires to, to act upon and develop a plan. Um, this plan would serve as a regional document. Uh, the plan provides county leadership to the issue. It's very important. The plan is connected directly to the Thurston Thrives initiatives, uh, which we've seen a lot of progress on, and, and quite frankly, the housing action team has had the most momentum and the most progress of, that I have seen of any of the other action teams across Thurston Thrives. Um, at a recent action team summit um, with all of the different Thurston Thrives partners, homelessness and housing was seen as the number one top priority. This plan serves as a foundational document for all of the jurisdictions in our county to develop their response and plans around homelessness and housing. This is an opportunity for the county to take a lead and help other communities' jurisdictions, so the other jurisdictions in our county, to help uh, work alongside this plan. Without the adoption of the plan, there's really no unified direction in this community. Approval of the plan from the county commissioners really does mean a lot in this community, and everyone from local governments to public housing agencies to housing developers to service providers to the individuals receiving services who all help to create this plan um, needs this adoption to move forward so we can enact on this. Like any plan, it's one that will continue to receive updates and recommendations from Commerce. We know that those are coming sometime here in December, January, I believe. Um, and the local continuum of care, Thurston Thrives, the county and local jurisdictions, um, as well as uh, a newly um, a uh, new position for the county for a homeless coordinator. Um, we'll all be working to make those updates to the plan once we have an adopted plan. There's really no valid reason to wait to adopt the plan or continue to try and edit this plan as that's gonna naturally occur just as part of being a plan. I don't know how many of you have worked on strategic planning before. How many times do you update that strategic plan from the time you start to the time you end it? Nearly right? every week. Mm -hmm. Every single week, right? Mm -hmm. So having an adopted plan at least lets us get our hands dirty and get in there and start working on stuff and really start being creative about how we can make um, adaptions to this. So um, 
finally, I just wanted to, to you know, compliment what Shelley says. Um, we're in a state of emergency. You know, um, that was declared. Um, it's been recognized, and we need to take action. The best way for us to take action is to get behind adopting a plan and start moving forward on it. So, from the local continuum of care perspective, and that chair sheet that I have, and all of those different members, uh, well over 50, 60 members associated in that, um, we would really like to make a recommendation today that you move forward and adopt the plan and work with us on all of your best ideas to help shape and form this plan as we move through the next five years. Sure. Um, think about those things that, are st that we can potentially put into the plan. I know we've kind of had a small discussion <coughs> of that, but I'm asking Keith if he has any comments in regards to what you, did, what you just said and what Shelley said. Thank you, Commissioner Blake. Uh, I really don't have much to add in regards to Derek's comments. He, I think he covered it from, from uh, uh, start to finish. But when you look at the goals that are included in this plan, the goals are really, really admirable. And hopefully things like regional cooperation we can continue to work on with the city. Of course, the city has some new funding coming its way. And hopefully some of the other jurisdictions in the county will follow suit on that and we'll be able to continue our coordination efforts with the county to, to meet the, the needs of our community. Shelley pointed out to me as, as we were walking in the door here that uh, goal D, I think it is, uh, housing objectives, we've added two important uh, uh, tasks under that line that are, are probably not very well defined at this point. But what, what page are you on, Keith? Uh, I don't 29. Know. 29. 29. Thank, Thank you. you. Mine didn't have a page number. Good ad, Shelley. <laughs> Page 29. Thank you. Uh, item D, housing objective. Uh, added two new objectives there. The ensure adequate hazardous weather sheltering. Uh, Commissioner Blake has been working very hard on oh, that issue mm -hmm. uh, in coordinating that at a regional level. That, that's really important. And then reduce unsheltered population and, and address a, encampment. That's an issue that's near and dear to those of us in the city of Olympia. Uh, we're experiencing ever-growing encampments in our community and are trying to develop strategies to deal with that. So we're glad to see both of those items included in the plan. Thank you. Yep, thank you for those comments. And so back to you, Shirley, just for a second. When was the last time when was the, this uh, was adopted? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I mean, I'm just trying to say how long it's taken to get to this point and all the social issues, the economic issues, whatever has been now we're finally bringing this to a closure but we still have more to do right there are some of the things like the fairness policy the equity policy maybe you could talk a little bit about that and then we have questions for you go ahead sure um, the initial 10-year uh, plan was originally adopted in 2005 mm -hmm. so that expired in 2015 um, the uh, then the advisory committee commenced work on to develop the plan and um, commerce was kind of in a limbo, it's a legislative limbo in providing new guidance for counties to adopt a new plan. So um, they did come out with new guidance that communities do a five-year plan. Um, that plan must be uh, focused on ending homelessness and must be consistent with the state strategic plan which they just passed um, this last January so the state just updated their strategic plan January 2017 uh, uh, House Bill 1570 just passed in uh, this last session and updated the RCW um, amended uh, the language and the requirements as far as guidance to counties for um, homeless housing plans um, and uh, the primary thing they say is that they're coming up with a new guidance that will come out as Derek referenced December 1st 2018 counties must adopt a new plan December 1st 2019 so we will be <laughs> we will be actively working to, to update this but uh, as Derek said this is um, an excellent foundation uh, very timely very much needed um, and if you um, like I can go over what the state uh, kind of the state high-level plan uh, details are requirements and then Derek can go into some more specific local sure. okay so um, the I'm looking at page eight in your document okay. of the state statutory requirements sure. because it's I'm important save you because we'll have a few questions but go ahead sure okay um, because the local plan must be consistent with this so all of the goals um, inherent in this plan brought forth by the Advisory Committee um, include 
these requirements. So that's um, effective and efficient coordinated access and assessment. That is our local coordinated entry that's described in this document. Um, an effective and efficient crisis response system as measured by cost per successful exit to permanent housing. So that is our shelter exits. Uh, in the Thurston Thrive strategy map, uh, the red team area on that map um, is solely focused on the crisis response system. Um, goal three is identify policy changes and resources necessary to house all unsheltered people. That is our ultimate goal. Uh, all roads lead to housing was the, the theme that we covered in the last uh, presentation. Um, that's really um, our ultimate goal. Uh, goal four, qualifying what would reduce the number of new people um, becoming homeless. So we want to prevent homelessness before it happens or divert um, those that are experiencing a housing stability crisis from entering the, entering the um, shelter system or onto the streets. Uh, goal five, um, transparent and meaningful accounting of state and local recording fee funds. Uh, House Bill 1570 uh, that I just referenced that was just passed included an increase in document recording fees. Uh, we also have several other sources of funds which I covered uh, last time in my presentation um, that's included in this, in this plan. This, and as Derek said, this plan is also tied to our federal funding. Um, Goal six, fair and equitable resource distribution. Um, one addition that uh, we uh, added to this plan was reference to uh, racial equity and disparities that um, our latest point in time count uh, data revealed some very concerning disparities and disproportionate number of people of color that are experiencing homelessness in our community. So we wanna get on top of that and address that and your crisis resolution also address that. Um, and then increased investments in housing unsheltered families with children, chronically homeless people, and preventing youth from exiting to homelessness. And that's primarily what our coordinated entry system is designed to focus on and serve. So that was kind of the foundation for the goals that were developed locally. Then local communities have the opportunity to take that plus add tailored um, to meet the needs of the local community, which obviously that, um, you know, those needs change over time. So. Um, I'll let Derek um, jump into some of the goals and uh, local strategies that are being recommended. Let me interrupt. Has a question now, is that all right? Sure. So I want to go back to, before we get too far from you, Keith, what you were saying on page 29, the bottom two were added, ensure hazardous sheltering and reduce unsheltered populations and addressing encampments. What, that was something you worked on, you, you said, to get uh, uh, involved? Hazardous weather. Mm -hmm. The hazardous weather, and because I know the, the encampments are a hot, very hot topic right now for Olympia, uh, an exceedingly hot topic. And is that, is that the goal also to get that reduced to functional zero? A move towards a functional zero. Mm -hmm. hey, absolutely, from the city's perspective, that, that is our goal. Uh, we will be using this document as a base for a local homeless response plan, and our objective will be to get to functional zero. Uh, how long that's going to take, that's something we have to look at. <laughs> yeah. really mm -hmm. and, and to work to mitigate in the future to prevent people from getting in, like you were just saying, yeah. the goals right. from entering. Is that something we're going to be talking more about then in your goal, Derek, your so, goals now? So what we see in here in certain sections of the plan, are, we're talking about diversion strategies. We're talking about family reconciliation strategies for like the youth and young adults. And so... There's uh, benchmarks and goals to increase those services in there. And in some regard, since um, we've taken a while to adopt the plan, some of those things have come online in the last year. So we already have outcomes to produce that we could show on this plan once adopted, right? So we could already start showing you like how we've accomplished some of this in our community um, already. And we're excited to, to do that. Good, okay. So thank you for the interruption. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, you were gonna have the floor? So um, I think that, you know, thinking about some of our, our high level areas across the board, and if you look in your work plan, um, you know, starting on page 24, um, it goes across the major domains of expanding housing resources and the safety net, standardizing best practices, regionalizing public and homeless policy. And we've identified some of the action teams that'll be working on this, as well as some of the agencies that'll be working on this, as well as some of the funders that'll be working on this. So trying to be very strategic, and, and in some sections of the goal, you'll see that we have to be determined, 
because we need to learn something before we can put a target date associated with that or what outcomes we can put associated with that. So um, it's, a, it's a deep dive. There's a, quite a few pages of there, but it kind of really shows you, instead of just showing like very large macro things, we wanted to show you the details of how we think that we will get there under, underneath those macro areas. And as Shelly mentioned, um, you know, we all recently attended the statewide homeless conference, and one of the main themes is you will not end homelessness without having racial equity. And we looked throughout our plan, we looked through our strategy map, but we did not have that in there. And so we instantly got together and started working on how do we include that into our plan? How do we make sure that we reduce disparities? How do we make sure that we're more inclusive in our strategies at the front door? And we have sub-action teams already built in right now to look at our vulnerability assessments and say, are they equitable? Are they inclusive? How can we add more information in there that lets us tell a better story about what real vulnerability looks like in our community? So, I guess I'm talking from a standpoint that by operating from a draft plan, a plan um, we're taking action steps towards it, but by adopting it, we're actually taking the, the real steps to kind of show the outcomes associated with the plan. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, <laughs> who gets to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Are you collaborating with the legislature as well on this stuff? And by that, I mean you have one of those to be determined as the development implement a community-wide plan for addressing barriers for land to landlords and such. Well, and 25. You're on page 25. Yeah, on page 25. And, and that, that, there's a group called Civil Service, and they're looking at reducing that uh, barrier for people to come out of jails or prison. You don't have to tick the box that you're a convict or you've been convicted of some crime because that reduces your, that's a barrier to getting housing. Is that something that's also addressed in here? at the state level? I know it's just community, but. Yes, um, I'll just say a couple things to that. Um, Thurston County became a member um, this last August in the Washington um, Housing Alliance. So that is our advocacy group. It works closely also um, with uh, WASAC, Washington Association of County, and Washington Association of Cities, um, as well as um, our human services um, advocacy group. And so um, we, and the continuum of care, I can let Derek talk more, engages uh, with them in policy development at the state legislative level. Um, in terms of the specific landlord activities, one of the subgroups of Thurston Thrives um, housing action team is the green and healthy homes team, but also includes rental housing um, and housing quality is con is covered in that group. And there's a rental housing symposium with the Washington Association of Landlords participating in other businesses um, coming up in September, I believe. November. Or November. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And through, um, so that's, that's our statewide level, and this is a national problem. Um, we're meeting, uh, I believe this month, with um, Congressman Heck uh, through Thurston Thrives to specifically talk about, um, through the Coordinating Council of Thurston Thrives to specifically talk about um, housing um, and, I mean, it falls in line with incentivized housing work that's also happening throughout the blue team. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're in tune with all the, the federal standards as well as the advocacy opportunities that we would have. Thank you. Let me turn to him and see what questions he has. <coughs> See, Hutch beat me to a couple of these things, so uh, wow. I didn't know you were going to allow questions. I'll mix it up a little bit. Midstream. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to spend an excessive amount of time because I'm ready to move forward on improving. Well, no, but answer, but, ask your questions. We got but, plenty of time. Uh, I got Shelley you. Made, a, made a statement earlier that uh, between 25 and 2015, we had a 10 year plan, and the goal was to eliminate homelessness. We obviously did not. Uh, accomplish that. What did it look like then in 2005 and what does it look like now? And where I'm actually going with this, I want to make sure we don't repeat history and that we do have adequate new procedures and policies in place so that we don't repeat that. So I don't know what we did during that period of time but I, I can see the picture has dramatically gotten worse instead of gotten better. And I kind of, I'm a realist. I like to come up with, uh, I don't know if we can ever say we're going to end homelessness. We can talk about reducing homelessness. Well, that's functional zero. Yeah. Use that word. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I just think we want to be realistic, you know, all the way through. 
But I would really like to know, and I think the city of Olympia is their ADU business and that uh, smaller homes and uh, affordable housing, and I think they're headed in the right direction, and I think we're looking at that as well from the county perspective. But I would like to know what did it look like then mm -hmm. when you adopted a 10-year plan compared to what it looks like now, and then we can look at what we need to change. Do you want a quick picture sure. of what 25, just, 2015 yeah, looks like? Real quick. Okay. If real you quick. could look on page 11 of what your is? packet, there is a point in time count report that starts in 2006. So we don't have, I mean, we do have back to 2005, but this chart only uh, starts in 2006. But that would be the first year after the plan was adopted that uh, that this census was conducted. So you can see in 2006 that we had 441 individuals um, counted that were identified as homeless in 2006. Uh, what is not too difficult to see is that spike in 2010, um, which was directly related to the big recession. So um, there was a major housing crisis. A lot of people um, became homeless. Um, there was quite a bit of time of recovery efforts. Uh, then we had an influx of a little bit of um, federal fund. There was actually a good investment of um, federal funds that uh, came called uh, HPRP, Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing. Thank you. Um, I just couldn't, I remember HPRP, but I couldn't remember the rest. Sorry. So um, so that was uh, allocated to communities to try to help to mitigate this. Um, and it had some, um, some help there. But as you can kind of just see, if you were to draw a little trend line there, it's kind of been like, you know, it's kind of like a little bit of a roller coaster. And the concern that we see is it's going back up. And from the information that we have from State Department of Commerce, um, who tracks our statewide trends, is this is uh, where we are in Thurston County is where every other county is in the state. Um, some, are, um, some are in a little bit better. Some are in uh, worse positions than we are um, based upon the populations. But generally, the trends are the same. Um, homelessness is increasing again. And um, it, uh, it, in a big part, the evidence we have is that it is tied to housing affordability. So that's the primary uh, number one cause of homelessness that's identified in our census and um, one, of the, one of the big issues uh, that we're seeing. So it's complex, but I think this plan um, does also uh, address um, some housing affordability and is restructuring um, our systems to better serve those in the greatest need uh, first. So that's, uh, I think, some really important uh, changes in policy that we had from HUD that have been implemented um, that are reflected in this plan. But it's uh, our North Star is definitely to end homelessness, to achieve functional zero for sure, so that we have enough resources to meet the needs as they, as they come into our community. Um, it's going to take some big investments, and although we have some um, new resources coming, coming in, it's not just resources that make the difference here. Um, it is all the goals that are referenced in this plan, and that includes working together regionally, um, working together on policies, um, making sure that you're uh, following all those uh, principles that, that Derek and I both have discussed. Good. Does that answer your question? Well, to a degree it does. Uh, basically, since the first plan was implemented until today, homelessness has doubled in that same period of time. I don't think the general population has doubled. We've put a lot of money into trying to solve this problem. I just want to make sure that we don't encourage, I'll just say outsiders, if you will, to come here from San Francisco or Detroit uh, to take advantage of our willingness to help others. And so somewhere there has to be a balance between enabling and helping. And, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get put into this policy and plan as to how we address this issue. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of ways we can address that. But doubling the homelessness problem in that time frame, when the population didn't do so, now that you can argue economics might have been a driver. Uh, there could have been other things. But 
I want to make darn sure that we are smart in expending our very limited resources so that we help folks, but we don't encourage a migration to our community. That's kind of what it goes there. Any comment? Yes, um, we discussed that a little bit at um, our last session as well. So the data that we have from our latest point in time census um, shows that the majority of those experiencing homelessness in our community are from our community. Um, that's the large majority. The, those that come from other counties or other states um, is consistent with the same pattern of the regular general population. So people come and move around for um, lots of different reasons, for work, for family, and so the um, trends that we see in our um, population of those experiencing homelessness is consistent with the general population and our resources are largely invested in those that their last residence was right here in Thurston County. Um, furthermore, those that do move here and are and experience... I, I interrupt you just for your sure. last residence mm -hmm. prior to their homelessness situation? Was yes. In other words, they may have had a job or... That's the question on the point in time census is um, there's where uh, there's where did you sleep last night um, so that we know where you know in which area of the county uh, that they were experiencing homelessness and then there's also the question of um, where was your last uh, permanent residence. I'm not sure. I don't think I have that exact not question exactly correct, but, it, but essentially that's what it captures okay. is where did they reside um, permanently before. And so um, what uh, what we see is um, it's over 60% that are from Thurston County and then others from, um, you know, neighboring areas. And, you, you know, we mentioned that this is a regional issue. It is a regional issue. Um, it's not just Thurston County. It's all of our kind of count, all of our counties together in our region um, that uh, are having the you know having the same same issue, and uh, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Do you have another follow up? Okay. Have anything else? Either one you turn? I just want to reiterate that um, you know methodologies and uh, point in time counts and being able to track. Uh, we learn. Um, we learn how to do better counts. Um, some of the fluctuations that oh. you see in this mm -hmm. um, may be partially due to methodology. Um, because we do well in a point in time count in recognizing our most vulnerable citizens mm -hmm. who are experiencing homelessness, <laughs> um, that's actually a good thing because we're actually being able to identify who in our community needs those services. Um, and then the second point I just wanted to mention again is that um, uh, the resources that are uh, being made available by the county and by the city um, are typically matched really well with state and federal resources as well, which makes the whole package of funding to address this issue. Have we done better with HMIS? I guess it's... Uh, what was your question, HMIS, Commissioner Blake? Uh, the Homeless Management Information System is the system that we utilize to collect data. So, um, so all of those that we contract with, as well as others, um, participate in the Homeless Management Information System in addition to the annual point in time census. So those are two different kind of major ways in which we can collect data um, every single day on a daily basis and throughout the year, as well as that kind of snapshot right. of those who may not um, always be engaged or captured in the system. Just, just and then at the coordinated entry door. arbitrary numbers or whatever, we try our best to keep a database to be able to drive the, where we want to put Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Yes, mm -hmm. abs absolutely. Just, just real quickly, I've been talking to the business community down downtown and they are very concerned that we come up with a solution because they can't rent their buildings out their businesses aren't being successful because of this problem so are we incorporating that input into this plan as well yes okay and our intention is to use this as a jumping off point for a homeless response plan that's specific to Olympia. Uh, Colin and Amy will be working on that in, in 2019. But again, this will serve as an important guidance for that plan going forward. And we will definitely be incorporating the views of our downtown business community into that planning effort. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Hudson, then we do a little wrap-up real quick. Sure. I am going to be able to digest this over time, but it is exceedingly um, <laughs> comprehensive and well done. And if I have questions, I, I have some questions, but not for now, or not at this point in time. 
Uh, but I do. I will have some questions, and I will contact either Derek or, or Shelley, someone, for uh, some clarification. But well done on this. Well done. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, the credit is really to the hard work of the advisory committee um, that spent a lot of time, weekends, nights, a lot of volunteer hours um, go into this go into this effort. In addition to the regular services um, and kind of the frontline work that they're doing every day to to implement the actions of this plan and end homelessness and make a difference in the lives of those that they're serving. So really. A uh, huge, huge thank you to everyone and all of our partners that gave feedback and all the jurisdictions um, that participated as well. So, yeah, I don't want to leave anybody out. Olympia, include everybody that worked on this. Thank you very much for your work. So, out of this comes a tasking. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if you could just reiterate, re reiterate the deadline for the, the Department of Commerce uh, as far as their new guidelines coming out. Uh, I can't remember. You said December 31st? Yeah, the state legislature gave um, the Washington State Department of Commerce the deadline of December 1st, 2018 to give guidance to counties on what they want to see in the next version of five-year plans. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, bill also calls out that counties will adopt that plan, the new plan based upon those guidelines December 1st, 2019 for another... Uh, December 1st, 2019. December Yes, first 2019. 2018, we'll have guidelines. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to have a year uh, to, uh, to, to work on updating and amending the, this plan. And I think that a lot of, since the state strategic plan that was just adopted, um, they don't, um, there is guidance in that legislation for them to update their strategic plan as well. But I think many of the foundational elements that we'll see, uh, we have reflected in this plan and we have active and engaged work groups ready to get so going on that. So the tasking is fairly simple then, I guess, in the perspective on the strategy map, and we don't have one in front of us, but put it's that, new packet. okay, it's sure, it's in there. Uh, adopt that timeline to this particular five-year plan so that we can stay in tune with uh, over our period of time and I'm literally wanting another line at the bottom of the five-year plan I mean of the strategy map so that we can see it walk it over time so that we're in concert with them and then be in the Department of Commerce and meet that objective is what I'm trying to say is so simple put a line on there and put some dots in time and so that everybody who's involved in this can see where we're at in the flow of things Sure. Uh, you would like us to add s uh, dates to this plan for your approval, consideration for approval yeah, today? Future, appro future approvals, yeah, as we revise okay. it. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Pretty simple, I know, but I want to make state it, state it for the public record. So. Okay. Any comments from the budget, Romero? Uh, no, and, and looking for a little bit from that side's perspective and um, looking at the different goals and the different tasks is uh, very impressive. And, uh, and, and, and really, it's a lot of work to do. And I'd really like to uh, praise the, the team because they have set up a, a starting date. Mm -hmm. They have a mid point to mm -hmm. check in and mm -hmm. ultimately five year plan implementation. Mm -hmm. And gets to the point of very specifics as to what each task needs to be accomplished. So, kudos. Uh, well done. Thank you. Derek, Shelley, or Keith, any last comments? Colin, Gary, Amy? Say it. Oh, I love that motto. That's great. That's great. Yep. Great ending. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank so the, you. From the procedural point of view, mm -hmm. you, for your consideration, will be a formal adoption of the plan this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I do that all the time. Okay, we're going to move into executive session. So it's going to be closed for 15 minutes. Um, Commissioner, if, um, if if we can come back after the fact, we really need to touch base on the Puget Sound Green. I want you to do that first. Five minutes. Five you minutes. Know. Okay. Please. Um, and I think well, we, you don't have to leave. We're not going into executive session yet. But if you want to listen to the future, <laughs> uh, Martin, Martin is here. No, not yet. Still five minutes. So let me. We have one more business yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> let me let me frame this for you very quickly. Sure. Um, let me take you back maybe um, eight months ago when uh, Puget Sound Energy came uh, as a proposal to the county to see if we can get into a program as to how we can uh, buy uh, power, green power, and at that point was related to the, the windmills.
Mm -hmm. They were trying to implement in South uh, uh, Thurston County as well as North Thurston County. Since um, that didn't materialize at that point, the county didn't participate in that, and it was because of, of, of your, um, the potential quasi-judicial decision that you could have made as a result of moving forward with the permitting process of that uh, particular project. Since that changed, the, 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 uh, the project only was uh, stated on North Lewis County and there is nothing in, in Thurston County. So this is another opportunity to, for the county to buy into the green, um, um, green direct phase. In this particular case, it's not related to the windmills. It's related to uh, uh, solar panels, farms, they're, they're planning to build in Eastern Washington. No. So in, um, if I can just take you to the attachment that you have in front of you. The yellow page. And this one. Yep, the blue one. The large page. That will give you an indication as to how much money we could save the county uh, from uh, getting into this green direct uh, program. And, um, and just to give an example, if you, let's just take a year 2023. Um, and if I can direct on this delta savings, mm -hmm. for instance, in 2023, you could potentially the county saved $62,138 in power. Mm. So those are the benefits. If you can go across, those are the benefits that the, uh, the you have. Those are the planning uh, uh, options they, they will have for you. Um, and. Um, my recommend the, the caveat on this thing is if, if the board uh, agrees to move forward with this plan and be part of this green direct, there is a commitment to be part of uh, up to 18 years. 18 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think there is a, I, from my point of view, is a, a tremendous benefit to be part of this. There's a cost savings. And I think we, uh, we as a county will do our best to get into the, uh, uh, do our best to reduce uh, the carbon footprint along the way. Um, there is a, a caveat to the whole thing as anything else. <laughs> uh, PSE came uh, to us just last week with this proposal, okay? And, uh, and they would like to have a, a, a response uh, from the county by September 4th. How come it's always in a rush? Uh, and I specifically asked that, said, <laughs> and I explained that in phase one, it was the same thing. You put us in the position to, that I, at this point, I don't have a, a, a a, a quorum in the next two weeks and say, could, could it be if the commission is approved to just send you a letter of, you know, agreement and we just work through the details later, so we're going to uh, check that out. So it seems to be driven by the regulatory process that they're subject to from the Utilities and Transportation Commission. They were only authorized to publicly start talking about this project last week and the go live for the public offering is September 1st. So that's the time window that's they window. have to work within. They didn't do it to do it to you or me or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just, it, it just uh, This is a new product in a sense, a new, relatively newer thing. So the UTC has only actually authorized two phases and after these two are done, they'll pause any further expansion until UTC can evaluate whether or not the program has worked as intended. We have questions. When you say new product, do you mean you're getting more wattage for the same square footage of surface, or what's, what do you mean by, by new, product, new product? I mean, the way that Kelsey described it is this way of essentially buying into an energy project and using that buy-in in order to lock in a reduced rate or reduced growth rate um, because we're essentially, we're we're getting a commitment that energy costs would only increase by a fixed amount over time rather than being subject to the variations of the marketplace. So that's the new product. It's a way of Okay, so there isn't any in new managing technology your that's no. doubling no. the output no. for the it's, same it's, square it's, footage. It's, it's a so. way of buying energy from a different from source. A different way. Oh, okay, yeah. I do have a follow up though. Go ahead, get it out of the way. Uh, Okay, we're all trying to reduce our carbon footprint, all that from di different communities have taken this on as a strategy. Uh, I know the Tenino School District, for an example, bought, I don't know, $100,000 worth of solar panel installation 
on their buildings that happen to be facing the right direction, usually like a, a south facing road. So their goal is to reduce their power bill, mm -hmm. which that's our goal to reduce, to do things better for the taxpayers and reduce the carbon footprint. So if we've got the ability to do something sim similar that Tenino School District did on a much smaller phase, you know, a, a scale than what we would be capable of doing, might the money be better spent by making that direct purchase because it comes with warranties, guarantees, all that. There's other beneficial things that come with it. I mean, you, if you put it on a roof, you protect the roof from the solar uh, process of deterioration. And so there's a lot of other things that we could take into consideration if we had time to consider those. And so that's where I'm coming from on we never seem to have time to look into something adequately before we're asked to mm -hmm. make a decision. A thorough discussion. Yeah, and so I, I'm not against this, I'm all for it, but I'd hate to buy into something and then find out, gee, we could have went 10 times what Tonino did and paid it off within seven years, and now we've got a revenue stream. So, you know what? It all, just all, bugs all, me. All good points, yep. Commissioner. All good points. Any other comments? This has something to, you said this has uh, solar panels in eastern Washington? Mm -hmm. They are, they, what I understand from Kelsey's description is that it is a combination solar and wind farm somewhere in eastern Washington. She did not have further details she could share at that time. She had no idea where, where it is? I well, think they, they know, it's just, it's just it's, the, the information is very tight very control. Tightly limited controlled. at this point given yeah. the regulatory Process they're over around going. a lot of them in Ellensburg right now. Well, Ellensburg and Goldendale you see, yeah, in the south. Got a lot of farms. Uh, a lot of potential. Okay. Do you need more information? I do. Yeah. I, I'd like yeah. to have more information. We love it, but we need more information. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, it's not that we're trying to stall. Uh, we just don't I, know what we're getting into. Yeah. Um, we'll try to going to reach out to uh, Kelsey to see if we have additional time, mm -hmm. and then we'll go from there. I, I, I would like to have a comparison of what this is offering, what the benefit to the taxpayers is with this process. And then, you know, you could scale it up. And I'll just use Tonino just because I happen to know about that. But why not have some kind of a comparison on I think the main benefit? challenge would be we don't have the staff to do that well, kind of an analysis. OK, of I an mean, energy. that might be, but that's and because we don't have the time to dedicate to do it. I, I don't want to jump into something. The skill sets, I mean, it's also we don't have staff qualified to do that kind of. Well, the superintendent system. down there, a phone call would be. Right, I'm just, you know, but in terms of coming beneficial. up with an analysis in a short time comparative of different hypothetical projects versus this, I, I'm just. And, and being, that goes back to my original statement yeah. that I just it's, don't it's, like. It's very tight. Okay, so yeah. this might not make it to the fourth, but it'll make it sometime in September, I guess, as far as. I yeah, know. and uh, and at that point, um, because I did ask Kelsey, what if the commissioners don't feel comfortable to make a, a cross decision? Mm -hmm. Uh, she said it may be other opportunities down the road. So. Okay. If this product is approved by the UTC after its evaluation, she did indicate they're hopeful that there might be a future opportunity yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, a good example is the wind farm down in Lewis County that didn't go. I mean, we were asked within a very short period of time to jump into the fire, so to speak, come find out it didn't pay off. Yeah. You know, and it wouldn't have paid off. I'm so. going to move on to the executive session. Okay. okay. Thank you, Martin. Sure. Thank you.